Welcome to live stream worship, Mulder Church. I cannot think of a better way for us to spend our time. Grab your Bibles, post your prayer request in the comment section, and let's prepare our hearts to honor our King. God alone is worthy of our worship. So let's join together in one voice as we give all praise and glory to Him. Good morning. Thank you for tuning in. You will let's sing together and declare His greatness in this place. Come on, let's sing out. He's coming on the clouds. King and kings will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare His praise. But who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's a rose. Chains. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. So open up the gates. So open up the gates. Make way for the king of kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's a roaring with power. He's fighting our battle. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the for the sin of the world, his blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. Come on, let's declare this. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? There is no one. Sing it out. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Come on, sing it out. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power. He's fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him.
continue to worship this morning. I just want you to know that you are all, every one of us, we are a son, we are a daughter of the Most High King. And I know that in this time, we don't know what the unseen is going to be. We don't know what tomorrow is going to hold. But he's got this in his hands. He's got our doubt. He's got our fears, our struggles. He's already, he already has them. He already has claimed victory over them. So today we're just going to sing out. We are a son, we are a daughter of his. When we get to the bridge, it says, when the lies speak louder than the truth and when the things of this world that speak louder than the truth, sometimes we need to be reminded who we belong to. And so we're going to sing out today and declare his greatness. Before he spoke creation, and God of heaven knew our names. We're formed in his reflection. We're formed in his reflection. We are his glory on his bed. His heart is good. His heart is good. He's always kind. Ways kind. With the cross he put, he is on my side. We're the sons and daughters. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. No matter where we go, we're close to the Father. on us He called us children of the King And in His love and kindness He chose the lowly and the weak His heart is good He is always kind the cross he proved, he is on my side. Come on. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. No matter where we go, we're close to the Father's heart. And though than the truth. God, remind me I belong to you. When I cannot see past the dark of night, remind me that I am always by your side. Let's sing this out. And when the lies speak louder than the truth, remind me I belong to you. And when I can't see past the dark of night, remind me you're always by my side. Come on again. And when the lies speak louder than the truth, remind me I belong to you. And when I can't
Thank you for worshiping with us today. Be sure to hit the subscribe button to subscribe to our YouTube channel and be sure to click on the thumbs up to like this video. We continue to ask our members to give faithfully during this time. There are multiple ways to give. You can text the number 334-708-3019, enter the dollar sign and the amount you wish to give. You can also go to moldechurch.com and click on the online giving tab or you can simply mail in a check to 3454 Fire Tower Road. We encourage families who are worshiping online to worship together in small group homes. If you're interested in participating or hosting, you can contact the church office at info at molderchurch.com or call 334-567-4225. Our youth group will be meeting today in person for the kickoff of our new worship service, Ascend 320. It starts at 320 and ends at 5 p.m. This service is for students grades 7 through 12. We named it this, so hopefully they'll remember what time it starts. We will also be having our blessing of the backpacks today from 4 to 5 p.m. under the cover drop-off in front of the church. Pastor Mara will be handing out prayer tags and praying over you as you drive through, so be sure not to miss that. We plan to open our doors for indoor, in-person worship on Sunday, August the 16th for our 11 a.m. service. Child care and Sunday school will not be available. We will continue to meet outdoors for our 8 a.m. traditional service and online at 9.30. And now here's part one of our new series, Processing. So you heard it there. Next Sunday, worship back inside of the worship center, 11 o'clock. I'm looking out upon some socially distanced chairs as I stand here. So we are ready for uh, you to come back into the building for the 11 o'clock service next week. But we also know that many will want to continue to worship online from home. And so this service will be online only, exclusively for you who are watching from home in one of our home groups or at home 
uh, at 9.30 uh, next Sunday, and our 8 o'clock service will continue to meet outside. You also saw the announcement about the blessing of the backpacks. I'm going to be out there with Mara this afternoon from 4 to 5 and, and uh, come by and receive a blessing and a tag as we get ready to start a new school year. All of our teachers and students are in our prayers. So uh, 2020, what a year that it's been. And I don't know if you've seen or not, there's uh, some posts that go around on social media of what 2020 is like. I've seen some of these 2020 be like memes, as they call it. 2020 is like when you were doing all that work in the field and you left your, your gate, your, your trailer open, and then you just like seemed like everything you were doing was you're going to have to go back and do it all over again. I've seen one that said uh, if 2020 was a narrator, 2020 had a narrator of this is what it would be like, someone yelling at us. Um, if 2020 were a slide, okay, uh, yeah, this has uh, got to be a Photoshop here. Uh, no one would do that to uh, their child. It's definitely not safe. Uh, 2020 were a pie. Uh, how about this one? Um, yeah, if you've seen the movie The Help, uh, you will know... Uh, Maybe you'll recognize um, that pie. 2020 were a pie, not the kind of pie you would want to eat. Um, and, of course, uh, the, the person of the year, man of the year for 2020 uh, from Time Magazine, Mayhem, the uh, character from the insurance commercial. We've had lots of mayhem in 2020. And if there's a common experience in 2020 for all of us, it is that all of us have experienced loss to some degree through this season. Maybe it's the loss of time with loved ones, getting able to be able to get together with grandparents with, for my kids and spend time with their cousins and wanting to take trips and places where you're going to go. They're all closed. All those places, those outings, special events canceled, sporting events canceled, being able to get together with loved ones, being able to get together in church, be able to have church gatherings and to be able to, to see each other's faces, not have to walk up to somebody and think, I think I know who that is, but they got a mask on. Is that you? Is that you? Um, and a hug and a handshake, those, uh, those uh, welcoming, affirming touches, we're not able to receive those and, and without some degree of awkwardness, even if we are, elbow bumps. Uh, and, and of course, there's other more significant losses. Some have experienced the losses of love, lo loss of loved ones. There's been health crises. There's been economic crises, loss of jobs, all of these things. And, and in life, in any year, there's going to be losses. There will be losses that we will experience in any year. And we'll see that uh, p p perhaps more losses in one year than another. And, and, uh, and everyone experienced losses in different seasons of their life. But this has been a unique season in that we, there's, there's been a collective sense of loss. We all feel like we have lost something. And while we are journeying through our own individual experience of loss of all that COVID-19 has taken from us and the feelings that go along with that, whether it's anxiety, whether it's depression, whether it's anger, sometimes there's physical manifestations of that grief or that anxiety and what we're feeling in our own health and our own bodies. And we experience that individually. But what we often don't appreciate is that everyone is journeying through that. You're stressed out about this. Well, they're stressed out too. We're all have been experiencing grief and loss and stress to some degree or another in this time. In the 1960s, uh, psychologist Elizabeth Kubler Ross uh, came up with or presented a, uh, wrote a book, and in that book, his counselors have taken it and used it today, where she talks about the five stages of grief or the five stages of loss. And uh, she presents those, they've generally been accepted as those stages of grief include denial, then anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. As we process through our individual losses, and you can broaden that out as a society, as we experience this collectively in these days. Now, they don't always have to be in this order, and, and everyone experiences loss differently. They, we process through it differently. But there is this statement that can be made for sure that when we journey through these steps on the way toward acceptance that we want to make choices that help and not don't and don't hinder our healing we want to make choices that help not hinder healing because when we're going through grief and there's all of these emotions that are going on inside of us 
we can make choices that multiply grief, that multiply losses, that create more grief, that, that there's others who experience a greater sense of grief because of the grief that we're experiencing, that we're processing through ourselves. And while it is true that each of us process through it differently, we can say that if we're going to get to the place of acceptance, if we're going to get to that place of healing, that we must first admit that there's been a loss. That we must admit the loss before we can accept it. Now, in the Bible, there are plenty of examples of persons who experience loss. The Bible is the story of the lives of people. And just like people through all of history, they experienced loss and journeyed through intense losses as intense out as our own. We journey through, if not even more so. And one of those characters that we look at that experienced a great deal of loss, in fact, so much, so much, so much so that he is identified almost exclusively with loss and with a time of grief in the history of the people of Israel and Judah, is that his name was Jeremiah. Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. He experienced and witnessed intense loss in his days, in his years of ministry and of life. Jeremiah is credited with writing two books in the Bible. Both of, the, both of those are in the Old Testament, one being Jeremiah, the one named after himself. But he's also credited with writing another book that's known as Lamentations, okay? Lamentations being uh, an expression of grief, an expression of sadness is a lament or a lamentation. And that's what that book that is credited to Jeremiah is identified by a book of lamentations. When I was ordained uh, a pastor uh, at First United Methodist Church in Montgomery, it was a big event, and, and uh, we were invited. To, it was if you ever been in that church, it's a magnificent, beautiful sanctuary, and kind of intimidating, a little imposing. And, and uh, we had to walk up on stage, and the bishop was there, and he laid hands on me to ordain me. And there was other clergy mentors of mine gathered around there. And I noticed that uh, as you're ordained, that, that there's an open Bible that's handed to you to take authority to preach the Word of God, and you have to when you kneel there that you have to place your hands in the open Bible. And as my colleagues were going up and being ordained before I was, I noticed they were placing their hands in this open Bible. And so I wondered, like, when, when the Bible was open, what passage would my, la my hands land on when the bishop ordained me? I, I just I wondered what word would the Lord speak to me in this high moment, in this moment of ordination. And when I went up there to kneel and the bishop laid hands on me to, to commission me and my parents were there and there were other clergy who were mentors standing around. I looked down and uh, under that open Bible, my fingers, I saw in, in big black letters the word lamentations. It was the first page of the book of Lamentations where I had uh, placed my hands when I was ordained. Jeremiah prophesied in a time of great distress for the people of Israel. And in his ministry, he witnessed the loss of everything that he held dear. He saw his country and his city. He saw it choked out and then carried off and finally destroyed, wiped, basically leveled to the ground. And it would be one thing that would be to witness all of that. It would be hard enough if it happened all at once. But it happened for Jeremiah gradually and for the people of Israel. It was this gradual, slow, kind of unfolding catastrophe where it started off with the kingdom of Judah, which was uh, Jeremiah's country, where first they were made a vassal state to the Babylonians and to King Nebuchadnezzar, and they had to pay tribute. And then Nebuchadnezzar came and he took off all the nobles of the land, all of those who were leaders in the country. He carried them off into exile to live in Babylon, basically as a further way to subject or to bring into subjugation the people of Judah. And then even after this, the people of Jerusalem rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. And finally, as a last straw, he came in and laid siege to the city, where basically starved them out. Horrible things happened in the city of Jerusalem before he came in and wiped it out. And he burned down the glorious temple of Solomon that had been there for centuries. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, witnessed all of this. And to make it even more torturous for him was that he could see it coming. He could see it coming and he spoke warning after warning after warning to the people that they would not hear, that went 
unheeded. And what's remarkable to me is this is the way that the prophets in the Old Testament are described, is that the word of the Lord comes to them and they speak it or they write it down. Sometimes it's dictated. They spoke it and someone wrote it down as they spoke. But in the midst of these days, in these darkest days for the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem, that the Lord was still speaking. And looking back centuries later, this was like 400 years, 500 years before Jesus. Looking back, we kind of could see what was going to happen. If you have some familiarity with the history of the people of Israel or with the Old Testament with biblical history, you know what's going to happen. But we see that in spite of this is that the Lord was speaking and calling out to his people to call them to change, to call them to wake up to change course that could change the outcome. So it would seem the Lord continues to call and to plead out, to plead to them. But in spite of this, what began to happen was that not only was Jeremiah's message rejected, was that it began to be that Jeremiah himself was rejected. And the people got so tired of Jeremiah's doom and gloom warnings that they tuned him out and it went beyond being tuning him out to actually seeing him as the enemy of the people. They, w- they wanted to be- get rid of him. There was a growing desire among some of the elites and some of the leaders in Judah at that time to get rid of him or even to kill him. At this time, there was a king in, uh, in Judah whose name was Jehoiakim. And uh, Jehoiakim... Uh, we're told on one occasion that the Lord speaks to Jeremiah and he says to him, I want you to write down all the words that I've already told you on a scroll. And Jeremiah's like, what? Lord, really? You know, I've already done all this, spoken all this. I want you to write it all down on a scroll is what the Lord says. And so Jeremiah dictates it and he begins to speak. He has someone to write it down while he says it, all the words of the Lord on a scroll. Well, it just so happens that uh, Baruch, the one that he dictates to, that he is an official with the king. And word spreads among the officials of the king that there is a scroll that, that Jeremiah has written. And Jehoiakim, the king, hears about this. And so he sends word to bring the scroll, to have it brought to him and read to him. And the scripture tells us that in Jeremiah chapter 36, it says that, that as they read the scroll to Jehoiakim, that as they would read a few lines in the scroll, that he would call for a knife, and he himself, he would cut off that part of the scroll and would throw it into, fi- into the fire. And this happened time and time again. He had th- eventually, the entire scroll was thrown into the fire. And as you can imagine, the Lord through Jeremiah didn't have a positive message for Jehoiakim after that. And then the Lord said to Jeremiah, I want you to write it all down again. Well, Jehoiakim's successor was his brother. Jehoiakim was removed from power, and his brother became king, whose name was Zedekiah. And during this time, Jeremiah continued to prophesy and to warn the people. But his warnings, again, continued to be rejected, and he himself perceived as the enemy of the people. Jeremiah was thrown into prison. And then on another occasion, after he was released from prison. It was told that some of the officials conspired to kill Jeremiah and they decided to throw him into a cistern. Now, a cistern was an underground a storage tank where water was kept, rainwater fell into the cistern. It was a large underground and it was used basically as reserves for water during dry seasons. And we're told that this was done at the permission of the king. These conspired together, and Zedekiah says, just do with him what you want. How can I stop you? And it says they threw him into the cistern, and it said that Jeremiah sank down into the mud, which meant that the cistern was dry, which gives you an indication of the distress that was happening in Jerusalem at that time, and also of the life-threatening nature of this, being thrown down into the mud and then sealed over, or at least there was obviously some way that he could breathe. And so then one of the king's officials, whose name was Ebed-Melech, we're told he was a a Cushite, which means he's an African. He was one of the officials of the king. And he hears about Jeremiah being thrown into the cistern. And he brings word to Zedekiah about this. And so Zedekiah says to Ebed-Melech, he says, get him out of there. And so they lower ropes down and they pull Jeremiah up out of the mud. And we're told that in Jeremiah chapter 38, verse 14... 
Zedekiah arranges a meeting with Jeremiah. And it happens, it says, on, at the third entrance of the temple, it says, Zedekiah, verse 14, sent for Jeremiah the prophet and had him brought to the third entrance of the temple of the Lord. Now, we don't know exactly where this third entrance was or what it was. But so it seemed that a place where a secret meeting could be arranged. This is actually the last record we have in the Bible of anything happening at the glorious temple of Solomon before it will soon be destroyed. A meeting between Jeremiah, the prophet of the Lord, who's just been pulled from a muddy cistern, and Judah, the king of Judah, Zedekiah. And here's what Zedekiah says. He says, I'm going to ask you something. Do not hide anything from me. I want you to be honest with me, Jeremiah. Here's Jeremiah's response. He said to Zedekiah, if I give you an answer, will you not kill me? Even if I did give you counsel, you would not listen to me. Even if I told you the truth, O king, you would not hear it because you don't want to hear it. You only hear what you want to hear. You want to kill me, or at least you are allowing your officials to conspire against me for preaching the word of the Lord. Well, Zedekiah responds. He swears an oath secretly to Jeremiah. Take that for what it's worth. We see here that Zedekiah is a tortured individual. Maybe he sees what is happening, but out of fear of the people or for whatever reason, he cannot accept reality. And he says to Jeremiah, he says, as surely as the Lord lives, who has given us breath, I will neither kill you nor hand you over to those who want to kill you. Take it for what is worth, Jeremiah. Zedekiah swears not to kill him. And here's what Jeremiah says to him. Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Here's what God says. If you surrender to the officers of the king of Babylon, your life will be spared and this city will not be burned down. You and your family will live. If you surrender... Surrender, give up. Surrender to the Babylonians, to King Nebuchadnezzar, that pagan scoundrel tyrant. Surrender to him, and the city will be spared. Your life and the life of your family will be spared. Well, what do we know about Zedekiah, we know that he can't hear that message. And the suggestion of surrendering to the Babylonians is unthinkable. Now, it's easy for us to uh, paint Zedekiah and Jehoiakim as villains. That's the way they are portrayed. That's what we, told, we heard told that they are in Scripture. And no doubt they are. They don't heed the word of the Lord. And it leads to the destruction of their nation, but not just for them, but for the, but for the, the decisions of all of the people. But to consider their perspective. Consider where they are coming from for a moment. Jehoiakim and Zedekiah were brothers. They were one of, or two of three brothers who became king of Judah. There was another one of their brothers who was king, but just for a very short while. But their father was one of the great kings. He was a legend in Judah. Do any of you know who their father was? A Bible trivia question for you there. They all were the sons of Josiah. And Josiah is considered as one of the heroes of the Old Testament. 
Josiah became a king when he was just a little boy. He, he succeeded his father Manasseh, who was a wicked king, who brought pagan idols into the temple. And there was the, the hope of the nation was embodied in this young boy who became a king. And he was instructed, and when he grew to be of age, he led the nation in a series of reforms. He had the idols put away and burned. He had the book of the law brought out and read. He led the people in a national repentance. And he brought back the Passover to celebrate it in the city of Jerusalem. Josiah who restored hope to the people of Judah. But then tragically, Josiah's life was cut short. He was killed in battle against Pharaoh Necho of the Egyptians. And the people mourned and grieved for this young man with so much promise whose life had been taken, taken from the people of Judah. And now here are his successors, his sons. And the pressure. I mean, you think about it. Our, our nation is 250 years old, the United States of America. But for 500 years, the descendants of David had ruled on the throne in Jerusalem. And now here is Jeremiah telling Jehoiakim and then Zedekiah, it's about to come to an end. Surrender. Throw in the towel. Surrender to the pagans. What? This can't be right. That this will be my legacy? That the kingdom of Judah ends with me? I will not let this happen. Not on my watch. You see, the people of Judah and their kings were experiencing the first stage of grief. They were experiencing a collective state of denial. Denial. It's the first stage of grief. It's a perfectly natural response. It's what our brain tells us that when we're not ready to accept it, when we're not ready to hear it, that we just don't believe it. We just can't accept that the loss has come to pass. And so we, we can't accept this. It just seems like it's not real. Sometimes when we've had an intense loss, it just seems like that. We're in a state of denial. We, we can't accept reality. It's so hard for us to see. It's a natural response. It's a defense mechanism. But while denial initially is a totally natural response, we see that it can prevent us from dealing with reality and from doing what needs to be done to help and not to hinder healing. The kings of Judah couldn't hear what they needed to hear because they didn't want to hear. And so while denial is a perfect, perfectly natural state to be in in grief, it's a state that we can't stay in. You can't stay in the state of denial. I don't know about you, but uh, I could relate to this. In our COVID-19 world, when uh, word came in mid-March that we needed to shut down to stop having large group gatherings. I had meetings with my staff. They reminded me of this this past week, and I had forgotten that I'd even said this. But uh, we early on said, we're not going to shut down. We're not going to stop having worship in this building unless they tell us that we can't. Well, they did, or at least they said that we shouldn't, and we didn't. We submitted to those who are in authority over us in the government and those who recommended that. But uh, my staff reminded me that in a meeting not long after that that I had made a statement, I said, we've got to be back in the building by Easter. We, we got to be back in by Easter. I'd forgotten I even said that. But then the CDC came out with recommendations on Palm Sunday or the week before that and said that, said that recommended eight weeks, eight weeks of no large group gatherings. And I said, if, if we can't meet for eight weeks, we're going to be in a world of hurt. It's going to break us. We're not going to make it. Eight weeks. And now here we are 20 weeks later. And I wonder that 
our prolonged experience with this, and I'm just going to ask this question because we all have different perspectives on this and, and, uh, and we don't know all the facts about it without question, but it's worth asking the question is that perhaps maybe our resistance to the recommendations that have been provided for us as this has evolved and, and as we've seen how things developed and there's been more research and all that, our resistance to the recommendations... Could it be that that resistance, whether it's to masks or to whatever that it is, could it be that we don't want to accept that or we, don't, we can't hear that because we don't want to? We don't want to hear it? Is our inability to accept or to embrace or to hear reality preventing us from recovering, from finding healing? Because here's where denial gets dangerous. It's a natural state. It's a natural response. There's not something indicating that there's necessarily that you're wrong about your grieving, that you're experiencing. But it's worth, as, it, as, as we continue to live in it, it becomes dangerous as it prevents us from moving forward in healing. And here's what's really dangerous about it. And here's what was so dangerous for those kings of Judah. Was that our inability to embrace reality results in an inability to hear from God. When we can't embrace reality, we can't hear from God. They wouldn't hear what God was saying to them because they didn't want to. They couldn't face it. They couldn't accept it. Because they didn't want to. Admiral James Stockdale uh, had been one that's been spoken about in different circles pretty frequently in the last few months. Uh, he, was, he was the highest ranking officer in the military to serve as a prisoner of war in Vietnam. And they kept him as a prisoner of war for seven years. And during that time, of course, it was terrible conditions. There was torture. There was solitary confinement. And I actually say that James Stockdale, that he actually disfigured himself, intentionally disfigured his face just so the North Vietnamese couldn't, couldn't just parade him on television as proof of how well they were treating their prisoners. Stockdale was a POW for seven years. And during that time, he saw many of his fellow prisoners succumb. They did not make it. They did not survive through those harsh conditions. They gave up. And so after he was released and, and uh, later he became a, a candidate for vice president of the United States, and he was asked, what was the difference between those who survived and those who didn't? And he said, I can tell you those who didn't survive. Those who didn't survive were the optimists. Because the optimists would tell themselves, we're going to be out by Christmas. I just know we're going to be out by Christmas. And Christmas would come and Christmas would go and they were still, they were still uh, in, in custody. They were still in prison, prisoners of war. They would say, well, Easter, we're going to be out by Easter. And Easter would come and Easter would go and nothing had changed. We're going to be out by next Christmas. And eventually, because of the prolonged season of the constant denial of those hopes, they died of a broken heart. And this led uh, Jim Collins, who re references uh, James Stockdale in his book, Good to Great, to describe something he calls the Stockdale Paradox. This is how James Stockdale survived those, that prolonged season of grief and loss in his life of being a prisoner of war. And that is face the brutal facts, but never lose hope. Face the brutal facts. We don't know what's on the other side. We don't know how long it's going to last. We, we know there has been a loss in this season. We face that brutal fact. But however long it takes, we will persevere. We will not lose hope. We will persevere no matter how long it takes. The Stockdale Paradox. Face the brutal facts, but never lose hope. I wonder what facts that are hard for you to face. Now, we're in an age where facts can be hard to discern. And what do we believe? Sometimes it's hard to know. But I can guarantee you this. You won't embrace them. 
you won't face them if you've already decided ahead of time that you're not going to. You won't be able to face the fact if you've already decided ahead of time what facts you will believe and will receive and which ones that you won't. And it brings us to this point. When it comes to hope, when it comes to moving on, when it comes to healing, we must concede what's been lost before we can receive hope. We must concede what's lost before we can receive hope. Jeremiah, I told you, was the, the doom and gloom prophet. He was the weeping prophet, the one who wrote lamentations. But isn't it ironic that one of the Bible verses that is most associated with hope, like one that many of you have committed to memory, you know by heart, maybe you have it on your refrigerator, comes from the mouth of Jeremiah. The weeping prophet spoke one of the most profound verses of hope in all the Bible. You know it. Maybe you know it. So many of you know it. Jeremiah 29, 11. What are the words there? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Those words were spoken to the exiles, to those who had been carried off to Babylon, to those who had already lost it all. And it seemed that all hope had been lost. They'd been, they're in the process of grief. And God speaks to them incredibly, even though the nation has been lost, the temple destroyed, the lineage of David seemingly ended. God says, I still have a plan. And it's a plan of prospering and a plan of hope. What you can't even imagine, what you can't see. You see, sometimes we can't see further than our own hopes. What I hope will happen. What I want to happen. The reality I want to see. But what God spoke to the people of Judah was that I have a hope that's greater than what you can see or imagine. Hope. See, they say it in a recovery program, 12-step program, that the first step is often the hardest to take. What's the first step in a 12-step program? If you've been through A, you have any familiarity with that, and the thing about it is that there's so many lessons there for us, too. We all are in that place. The first step is to admit that we have a problem. But it's not just admitting. It's not just saying, yeah, I got a problem. Yeah, I'm a sinner. Okay, I drink too much. Or yeah, I watch those things I shouldn't watch. Say those things I shouldn't say. Do those things I shouldn't do. Whatever. It's not just admitting it. But to admitting you are powerless over the problem. It is a confession of a loss that I have failed and there is nothing that I can do about it. I can't fix it. And it's that place of admitting that powerlessness is the, it's the hardest step to take. I mean, it'd be one thing if Jeremiah or the king say, okay, let's rally together and if we work hard and if we pray hard and if we build stronger defenses and we work our army and we can beat back those Babylonians. No. You are helpless. But in spite of that, there's hope. What's the famous line from the movie the Sixth Sense? Have you ever seen that? <laughs> There's uh, the, uh, Joel Hays Haley Osment plays the little boy. He sees dead people. And what's the line there? Is that they don't know they're dead. <laughs> they don't know they're dead because they only see what they want to see. And to give away the, the movie, suddenly Bruce Willis's character recognizes, that's me. I'm dead. <laughs> and I couldn't see it. I didn't know it. You see, a sure sign of denial is that you won't accept it, that you can't see it. You don't want to see it. You see, loss 
is universal. We all experience loss, and you can decide I'm not going to think about that today or I'm not going to deal with that. I'll wait to deal with it tomorrow. Fine, but you will have to deal with it. Loss is universal, and sometimes the greatest loss is admitting that we are powerless, that we are powerless against the forces of sin in our life, <laughs> that we can't do what we want to do, that we can't be the man or we can't be the woman, we can't achieve what we want to achieve. We can't, even, even if we do get there, it still feels empty. Loss is universal. But here is truth. And here is ultimate reality. Hope. Loss is universal. Hope is optional. You and I, we are worse sinners than we perhaps can even want to go there or think or imagine. But in spite of that, we are loved. And when we can't accept what's in our faces, the reality in front of us, we're not going to be able to get to the greater reality that's offered to us. Is that in spite of our loss, in spite of our grief, in spite of our fragility and frailty, which perhaps has been what's most difficult of all for us to face and accept in this time, in spite of this, there is one who came to live among us. God came to us. And he was familiar with sorrow. He was a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering. And he carried our griefs. By his stripes we are healed. And we see a cross. We see there the instrument of torture and death, the greatest loss in history. But even in the face of that, that cross is a symbol of hope. For you, for me, that even when we've lost it all, when there's death, there is hope of a resurrection. You see, these words are so powerful. This is so important because it literally, this can save your soul, I believe. I believe this is, this is critical. And that is when it comes to hope. You won't receive it. You won't experience it until you can see loss. You won't receive hope until you can see loss. And it may be the reason there's not more hope in your life right now is because you're not facing the brutal facts. You're living in la-la land. You're not conceding the loss. What have you lost? What have you lost? Could you have the courage to face that today, to admit it? I believe that that confession, that that concession can literally have the power to save your soul. Because then you're not playing games anymore. It's real. It's real. I'm walking through this grief. I'm walking through this loss. It's real. I, I feel it more than ever before. But in spite of it, I have hope. I will hope. I serve a God of hope, a God who raises the dead. Do you want that hope today? I have some discussion questions that for those who are at home and with your families and, and uh, those who are going to have Sunday school after this and maybe in, in, in groups gathered in your homes, I want some discussion questions for you to consider with your family, with those who see with you, and to talk about this. And those questions are just simply three. What losses? What losses have you experienced in this season? I mean, it's easy for me. I could name several. But have there been some of those losses that have been hard to admit? Why? Why is it so hard to admit? <laughs> or why not? And third, do you sense that God is offering you some hope in the midst of this loss today? What hope do you sense God is offering to you today? 
I'm going to pray for us. But I just want to say this, that all of this discussion paves the way for the next phase of grief that you won't want to miss. And we've seen plenty of this in our world today. And that's the phase of anger. We're going to talk about that next week. Before we do that, let me pray for us. God, creator of all, sometimes we're mad about decisions of leaders or we're grieving about another country and leasing a virus on us and circumstances beyond our control. Sometimes it's grief and distress and regret over decisions that we've made and how we keep failing over and over again. But deep down, I wonder if our real problem is with you. God, you could have. You could have stopped this. You could have stopped this from happening. I mean, you knew about it, and, you, and yet you still let me go through this grief and loss. So, Lord, I, I pray today that could we, even as we journey through grief and and all the emotions that we have and just coming to a place of admitting it <laughs> a moving past denial could we could we catch a glimpse of a god who doesn't remove all suffering but provides a way for healing and hope through a cross through coming and bearing our suffering and our sorrow and so we today maybe today we could lay aside our sword to want to keep fighting we could receive hope and believe we are loved today by you and to believe that your plans are to prosper us yes even now your plan is to prosper us and to give us a future and a hope I want that hope I want that in my life would you come live inside of me Lord Jesus to receive your life when I'm at the end of mine, when I'm in this body of death that's going to death and living a life in the flesh, would you give me the life that lasts forever? Through your resurrection power, we receive it. We believe in Jesus' name.
Good morning. I'm Brad Zamanek, associate pastor here at Mulder. We do have several prayer requests. Pam Karasik, who's dealing with back pain. We have the Graham family, whose daughter is moving out to Seattle for Connie Lampman and her son, Andrew. For Glenda Whitley and her sister-in-law, Carolyn, who has been diagnosed with COVID. And for the Redland Celebrate Recovery, that it's a safe place to experience loss. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we lift up those prayers and pray for your blessings upon them. We lift up your blessings on school systems, on administrators, on teachers, and on students from grade school through college. And dear Lord, we pray during this pandemic, all those that are suffering emotional and physical loss, we pray that your hope, that you are there. And we lift this up in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us online. And may that hope be with you this week and that you share it with someone else. And God bless.